All right, nine o'clock, let's get started. Good morning. So let's uh, talk about .NET Standard, .NET Core, and I'm going to try to explain to you a little bit the difference between both, and we are going to talk about a concrete example, with, which is how I took um, one of my open source projects called MVVM Lite, which is a fairly popular project, and I took it and ported it to .NET Standard, and so I gathered a few experiences, and we are going to see more about that in this presentation. So about myself, my name is Laurent Bunion. I'm a senior cloud developer advocate with Microsoft, uh, which means that I work mostly with the cloud, with Azure, but my expertise is .NET and Xamarin. And so later, we'll, uh, at uh, 1.45 p.m., I have another presentation where I'm going to talk about Azure, about the cloud, and about using that into cross-platform application. But of course, using .NET Standard, using .NET Core, and teaching those topics is also part of my activity. So we'll talk about that in this presentation. So thank you to the sponsors, thank you to the organizers for inviting me. I'm really happy to be here. And so let's uh, start by taking a little bit of a look back at where we come from with code sharing strategies, because it's really what .NET Standard and .NET Core is all about. It's about sharing code, okay? So in the very beginning, when we started doing .NET in 2001, basically there was no need to share, right? .NET 1.0 came with two client application platforms, I would say. One was ASP.NET, and so that was on the web. And the other one was Windows Forms, and that was on the desktop. And people were either choosing one or the other. They were going all web or going all desktop, and very rarely did we have to share code between those two platforms. So that was okay. And then in 2006, WPF came out. So it was another desktop programming framework, if you want. But again, usually people would choose either Windows Forms or WPF, and they were not really sharing code between those two platforms. So basically, this was a non-issue, if you want. But then, of course, came Silverlight. And Silverlight came out around 2007-2008. And suddenly, we had another implementation of .NET, which was a smaller version. So you had less APIs than in WPF, Windows Presentation Foundation, OK? And it was even worse than that, because not only did you have less APIs, but actually, sometimes you had more APIs, because they were adding stuff to Silverlight before they were adding it into the full-blown .NET, okay? The reason being that the full-blown .NET was released about once a year, it was kind of slow, and Silverlight they had released much more often, so they could add stuff a lot faster. And so basically for us as developers, when we had the Windows Presentation Foundation application, and then we were saying, oh, now I would like to make a Silverlight version, because it is compatible with macOS, for example, it is portable, Okay, there was even a version running on, on uh, Linux called Moonlight, uh, an open source version. So that was cool, but of course we had the problem of knowing if I have an API, is it going to run on Silverlight as well? Or if I have an API in Silverlight, is it going to run in WPF as well? So what we were doing at the time was what I would call develop preventively, meaning while we were kind of checking the documentation in MSDN, in the documentation back then, there was a, a combo box where you could see, okay, is it available in Silverlight, yes or no, okay? And we would share the files using a shortcut in Visual Studio. I'll show you that in a moment. And basically build twice, build one for Silverlight and build one for WPF and then fix the errors, okay? It was not super friendly, but it was working. So in Visual Studio, this is how you can share as a link. I'll show you an example in a, in a moment. But basically, that was the strategy. Now later, around 2011, came Portable Class Libraries. And so Portable Class Libraries was really kind of a breakthrough because it was the first time that we had some binary um, constructs, some, some binary assemblies that you could share between different platforms, okay? So it was the first time that we had that, which was really cool because as a developer, you could do a class library and then say, I want it to run on WPF, I want it to run on Silverlight, and then later Windows Phone, later Windows 8, later Xamarin for iOS and Android, etc. So the difficulty was, again, how do I know which APIs I have as a developer to use that? And so Microsoft came with a solution called the profiles. So they were saying, okay, if you have a 
uh, you know, a class library, portable class library running on .NET and Silverlight, that's profile number, I don't know, 74, I'd just say things like that. And then if you want to add Xamarin, that's profile number 57 or whatever. And basically nobody knew what profiles were which number and what it corresponded to, so it was kind of a mess, okay? Quite complicated. And so the result of the APIs that you can use in a portable class library are like the intersection of the platform that you choose. So if you choose .NET and Silverlight and Xamarin, you have basically all the APIs which are available for .NET, for Silverlight, and for Xamarin. So it's a least common denominator approach, okay? Now in Visual Studio, you can still create portable class libraries, but notice that they have been marked as legacy, okay? Because Microsoft is trying to push you away from that and rather into .NET standard, like we will see a little bit later. So if I summarize portable class library, you start, let's say, with .NET 4.6, okay? Now, of course, in that case, it barely makes sense because if you use only .NET 4.6, then you might as well go with a, with a non-portable class library. But if you add Windows 10, for example, UWP, then you add Xamarin, then you end up with the intersection of what you just added, okay? 